overdue. Here you've had a show for four months and you've not heard a word from me. Uh, the reason was this show was just thrown together. I knew we didn't have anything, so I looked at what I had at home of any quantity, and it was Ethiopian, so I had to do an emergency, put a show together, write it up, and uh, run and buy some more pieces. But, um, you know, you all come to me and thank me and Bob numerous times about having all this. But this would not be possible without several people that are on a committee and help. Okay. <laughs> Let me get it right up to my mouth. There are several people who work behind the scenes with me to help uh, make this all happen. They meet the, cr uh, the freight company when they deliver something. They help to ship it out of here. They pack it up. And this show, I was not here at all when it arrived. And these people right here hung this, uncrated it, hung it, and tended to everything. And, and they have worked with me over the last four or five years that we've done this. Because doing this from a distance, I only live here part of the year. It's hard. But I want you all to come forward. I have an Ethiopian cross for each one of them. And um, there's one for you, one for you. They're t this, these are small. And it's for the two of you. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, Ruth. Oh, hot, hot. How? Uh, Barbara Wolf, Andy Summerfield, and the Cushmans. And I am so grateful to them, and especially for them putting up this show. Oh, you're welcome. Those are not, I think they're only probably about 25 or 30 years old. They're not really old. But they are true to the... Um, Ethiopian style, and they're actually made in Ethiopia by those practicing. Now today, for this show, I really, I gotta figure out how to do it. Before we begin, I wanna address the good, the, um, the, good, the true, and the beautiful. Um, JD is constantly talking about this, and I heard uh, Kelly mention it. The gallery is, or the art is quite often referred to as beautiful. But if it's only that, I have missed doing what I'm supposed to do. There's a little book written by Philip Riken, who's the president of Wheaton College. I'm working on a project with him now. And it's called Art for God's Sake. At the end of the book, he says, all art, sacred art, must match all of those, the good, the true, and the beautiful. How do we know it's good? By the quality of the workmanship by the color, the media, how they have manipulated, what the work of the hands were that went into it. So that's one of the criteria that I, I, and the true is, does it depict with integrity the uh, Bible and its people, its cultures, its communities around the world? Um, and the beautiful. Beautiful is not pretty. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking beautiful art makes visible the invisible. It helps us to see something that's behind the surface. It takes us to the realm of the spiritual. It takes us to God. So I want you to always remember that with every show that comes here. That's what the foundation of all of them are. I don't buy them just because I like them. Um, now, I think we need a little bit on the history of Ethiopia, and it has a rich, rich history. Um, it has ancient roots in Christianity and in Judaism. I'm sort of gonna do this in off uh, sequence, but the Orthodox um, Ethiopian church claims that Christianity reached the country in the first century. You already know how, right? It was the uh, Ethiopian eunuch. And um, the first church in Jerusalem had only just begun when, uh, according to Acts 8, the apostle Philip was sent to witness to the eunuch 
of great, um, who was a great, a great authority under the Queen of Ethiopia. I'm going to read you the first part of that passage. If we had more time, I'd read it all to you. But I think it's going to be interesting to you to see one line that's in here. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south. Go to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. We know where Gaza is today, don't we? If I'd read this to you four or five months ago, you wouldn't have known. But anyway, the Ethiopian eunuch was there reading the Bible, and you'll understand why he knew the Bible a little later in my talk. I'm sort of turning things around. He was reading the Bible, he was reading from Isaiah, and Philip was directed to go up and talk to him, and he said, I don't understand what I'm reading. And the scriptures say that um, Philip told him about Jesus. And then uh, the um, eunuch, they went along and they found a river and the eunuch says, can I be baptized? And Philip baptized him. And then the eunuch went back to Ethiopia uh, carrying his faith with him. And those were the first roots that we know from scriptures. However, archeological evidence tells us that Christianity took its roots in Ethiopia in the fourth century. 330 AD, um, King Ezana declared that Ethiopia was Christian. It's the second oldest Christian country in the world. Can you guess who the first was? 20 years prior to that, Armenia. 310 became a Christian country. The roots are deep. Um, but there's something more. Who else do you know who was from Ethiopia in the Bible? The Queen of Sheba. And the Queen of Sheba went to see King Solomon, right? And she had heard great things about him, his wisdom, his wealth, everything. So she went, the scripture says, to ask him hard questions. And she went, she arrived. Now I want you to know she traveled 1,500 miles. So didn't the Ethiopian eunuch to come there. It wasn't an easy journey, I'm sure. Oh, there's a picture of the Ethiopian. I forgot my pictures. <laughs> One is by Rembrandt. How do we depict them? Um, that's King Esna. Okay, Queen of Sheba. The, over to the right, my right, is a triptych with the story of the Queen of Sheba. We know she went to King, see King Solomon, as I said. And... Um, he answered all of her questions. She was blown away. And she went back declaring what she had learned to her country. That's the, the Hebrew or the Jewish roots that came to Ethiopia very early. That's probably why the eunuch was even reading the book of Isaiah. There had been roots of Judaism in Ethiopia before the eunuch. So, um, but <clears throat> that isn't all of the story of the Queen of Sheba. They have an enormous legend that has um, twists and turns like I can't believe and it's depicted in those three panels. She supposedly was seduced by King Solomon and on the way 1500 mile journey back to Ethiopia, she gives birth to a son. The son she takes on to Ethiopia, he grows up he realizes he's the son of uh, King Solomon, so he travels to Jerusalem to see King Solomon. King Solomon is blown away. He says, I want you to come here. I want you to stay with me. You can follow me. And he said, no, he's going back home. So we went back to um, Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopia. Uh, there's a, this is all written up in a, a stories or the what would you call it? It's the history of Ethiopia for them. It's called the Kabra Nagast, or the glory of the kings. And it was written in the 6th to the 14th century. But that's their legend. But you know, in legends, there's always a nugget of truth. And how we sort that out, I don't know. But I wanted to include it because it's part, for them, it's part of their uh, faith journey. And to this day, Ethiopia puts as much importance on the Old Testament as it does on the New. It's 
So it's a little different from us. Let's change to thinking about the art of Ethiopia. Every, every, throughout Christian history, every area has found a way to depict or picture the Bible within the context of their own region, their own culture. Europeans depicted uh, Jesus as white, as in this um, Giotto piece. The Africans picture Jesus as African and black. And you all know how Sado Watanabe depicted uh, Jesus as um, Japanese because he wanted to find a way to minister to his own people. So the Ethiopians are exactly the same. They have found ways to depict the Bible um, in such a way that it relates to their own culture. Now, they're... Uh, Style is what we would call primitive. It's very simplistic. They have large, round, uh, I mean, almond-shaped eyes, very much like uh, Sada Watanabe uh, had for his Japanese people. Uh, they have highly saturated colors. And in the earlier work, which this reflects, it's extremely flat. There's no suggestion of um, space. The, the images in this picture are flat, flat tones of color. Now, the artwork that they have was primarily for their churches, not for their homes. This artwork that we see here is their liturgical visual language. This is how they spoke visually, because the visual was important in their churches. Their art was not for enjoyment. It was, it, it was um, to make the visible, the invisible accessible uh, to the presumed worshiper. The mon uh, there were monasteries and the monks created the icons and the artwork, very similar to what happened in European monasteries. They worked from prototypes. You'll see here, if I especially the Madonna child. The prototypes were something that was made early on, and every iconographer works from that same prototype, supposedly copying it, but they end up adding their own little bit of flavor. So you see changes that do develop. Icons have been important in um, the Ethiopian church from at least the 15th century. The, the, if you go to the Walter Museum in Baltimore, or you go to the Getty, they have the largest collections of Ethiopian art in the United States. There you will see the early pieces. There is no way I could get my hands legally on anything from that period. <laughs> in fact, some, a couple of the crosses that I handed out today came with a friend who brought them. He was stopped at the border and they took about half of what he had. So yours got through. <laughs> um, there's two forms. There are individual uh, freestanding forms is a way that they depict, uh, used as a format. Here is a triptych, which is on the life of Christ. We'll look at that again later. It's here. I only just acquired this. This show is going on to Dallas, Texas in about three weeks, and that will go with it. It's a triptych on the life of Christ. So triptychs and diptychs, we have a couple diptychs where there's two panels. Usually one side is more important than the other. And then we have the next and the most probably important were uh, gospel books, where the gospel book might have been this thick, every page was parchment, and there were paintings throughout it. Each of these are at the back, each of these is a page from an Ethiopian uh, gospel book, beautifully um, illustrated. And I showed, I cut out a little, I photoed the back of one of these. It's in, the Bible is in Ge'ez, which is the liturgical language of Ethiopia. Uh, some of you have been to Jerusalem and been to the um, Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Be 
On the way in, the main door, over to the right is a tiny little church where the door is going into where we're worshiping. That's the Ethiopian. I sat for hours in that in 1980 listening to them read their gospel. So if you're ever there again, you can slip in that little door in the, in the little piazza and go in and that's where the Ethiopian church is in Jerusalem. <clears throat> Now this is the only little gospel book that I have. It's really a prayer book. It's in the, um, it's here inside one of the cases. Um, most always it starts with the Virgin Mary. And I think this is a prayer book rather than a gospel book. Now my friend who went to Ethiopia brought this back. This made it through the line. <laughs> it's not, I don't think it's awfully old. I would think it's probably about 50 years old. Um, common themes, common images. One of them is Mary, the Virgin Mary. You saw on that little uh, prayer book, the very first image was a gospel, uh, was Mary. If we have time, I have a video from the Getty. You'll see that's a very important image. They put an enormous amount of importance on Mary. Uh, this started in the 15th century when the emperor declared that there would be 30 days of observance or part of the liturgical festival would deal with Mary. Um, in this Mary, uh, Jesus has his hands in a sign of victory. Mary is holding the infant. Look what's on both sides always in an Ethiopian icon of Mary. There will be two guardian angels, and we know they're guardian because they have the swords. This is um, Michael and Gabriel. Now, in the 16th century, the Jesuits went to Ethiopia, and they took with them a copy of the icon that you see here, um, which is housed in the uh, San, in Rome in the Church of the Santa Maria Maggiore, and so I was in Rome. I had some business at the Vatican to tend to, so I said, "There's no way I'm getting out of this town without going to see the Santa Maria Maggiore," and it was a side chapel in this big church. You can see on your left that this is a big chapel. That icon of Mary is five feet tall. And that day there were Polish people there having some kind of service and gathered around this icon. What is special about this icon is that Jesus is holding a book. And once this icon arrived in Ethiopia, it proliferated. And there are four pieces in this show where you will see Jesus holding a Bible. I think that's really interesting. You know, holding a globe, he was control of all the world. There were other symbols that we saw in Western culture. What does the book? I'm only suggesting that I believe it, it's the word made flesh. It's a beautiful symbol embedded in that. Now, this one we have right here, I just purchased this. You know, my purchasing artwork is a disease. <laughs> Bob knows something arrives every few days in the mail from all over the world. And this is the latest one I had because it was the clearest depiction relate, closely relating to the Santa Maria Maggiore piece. And this will travel with the show at this time. But you have several. There is one on the large panel over here, which I'll show you. That's the life of Christ. That is about 100 years old. It's one of the oldest ones I own. Yeah, it's right here. Um, so the, Mary is extremely important. You'll see her depicted. And the next most important one will be the life of Christ. And this, Mary is in the center. You know what's on her sides, right? Now you know that uh, Gabriel and Michael are guarding her. 
she has very elaborate clothing. That was why I wore this today. <laughs> this is not Ethiopian, but it's as close as I could get. <laughs> this is generic ethnic. <laughs> but if you follow this around, you would find um, the life of Christ. Um, I want you to particularly look at the upper left-hand corner. We're going to come back to that. That is the resurrection. Just remember it, you've seen this. But the rest, Christ carrying the cross, the crucifixion, you know, all of that. So take some time to find this. I found this in a little store in, um, right near our capital in Washington, D.C., about 25 or 30 years ago. And it was very old at that time. And it, it had been validated by one of the um, authorities on Ethan, Ethiopian art. So that is the most important piece that we probably have in this show. And then I showed you this life. That's the life of Christ. This is the life of Christ. And some of you, can, I'll stay after the worship service, and some of you can come up and see these, hold them, and I'll stay and take some of you around if you'd like that. So the life of Christ, but it's broken down into parts. This is a parchment piece. This may or may not have been part of a gospel book. This is the flight to Egypt. It's very colorful. This was made in the 1960s, and um, Jesus is not a teeny baby here. Well, we know he may be two, two and a half years old, right? Uh, Mary has a servant lady behind her. Joseph is going forward. Notice Joseph has white hair, because in, traditionally in Western art, Joseph has been depicted as an older man, an old elderly man. That was one way that the church could get around the fact that they could keep Mary a virgin. All the brothers and sisters came with this man whose wife probably had died. That's tradition. That's one of the ways the church has found to solve this horrible problem about how could Jesus be born without sin. But Joseph is depicted as um, uh, white-haired. And there's a guardian angel that's leading them to Egypt. <clears throat> I own another drawing from somebody from Austria. And it's the return trip. Jesus is, is much older. <laughs> we don't see that often. Another uh, picture that's really important to them is the Last Supper. And here, I think these are the same artists. These are both in the show. It's the Last Supper and Jesus washing the disciples' feet. They're beautiful, bright colored, fairly large, and these are on parchment. The crucifixion is really important um, to the Ethiopian church. I love their depiction. It's a sad day. The stars are falling from the sky. In sadness. They're almost like tears coming down from the heavens. And Mary and John are to the side. You see tears in both their eyes. This is similar to how you'll see almost all of their crucifixions. No, look at the chalices underneath his hand. They're gathering the blood. Isn't it wonderful how different people have found ways to help them see the scriptures? This is, um, I went running around the house trying to find this today, and I realized I'd put it in the show. <laughs> I own three or four of these. But this one, there's your crucifixion. But I want you to, to look to the left. What, this is the resurrection, but what's happening? Always in an Ethiopian resurrection, Christ is raising Adam and Eve from the grave. That's who's suspended on the cloud to his side. Sometimes you'll see it depicted, he'll be putting his hands down to raise them out of the grave. Because it's, this is not just the resurrection of Jesus in their mind, it's our coming resurrection. And they have found a way to teach that together. 
I think that's rich. This is a, um, a um, to be worn as a pendant or a pectoral cross. And the top of it, you can see the, the yarn or the string that would go around your neck and you would wear this icon in a procession or going to church. Now the Old Testament is not depicted as much, but I found this, and I think it's quite old. I don't know that, because sometimes I buy from people that they don't have a clue. It's been in the family forever. Somebody bought it when they went there or they inherited or something. But this is a very rich um, diptych. It's on fabric that has been adhered to wood, which is a typical way of done, and then painted on a surface. It has Abraham and Isaac in the upper left corner. Opposite that is um, um, Adam and Eve with the serpent wrapped around um, under the tree with Adam and Eve. The crossing of the Red Sea, and below on the other side is the expulsion from the garden. Very primitive. I think this is quite old. I have no way, maybe if I can get to um, take some of these to the Getty or to Baltimore, I could find out. But it's a beautiful depiction. And this is on parchment. This is a wonderful condensed Abraham and Isaac. I don't find these very often, but I'm in the middle of collecting um, images of Cain and Abel, Abraham and Isaac, and the crucifixion. And I'm, I'm hunting for a the theologian to write about this. So I was thrilled when I found this, Abraham and Isaac. The many ways, look at the, the, the angel and the, the, the ram that's below her. Now, what you've been waiting for, the processional crosses. Uh, you all did really well, the church did really well to let me put the scarf on the cross. <laughs> because everybody said, what is that about? But before I tell you that, the cross is the most highly revered object in all of Ethiopia, in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Because they realized it's on the cross that Satan was defeated. And for them, the cross is a symbol of, it's their physical armor. And the cross is perceived as a um, emblem of victory, not death, which is really rich. You know, the early church, in Rome and other places, you don't see crucifixions. You see the resurrections, but you see almost no crosses in the early, very early church because it was a shameful thing to have been crucified. However, the Ethiopian church saw it as victory over death. And so these crosses, the one, you, there is a, a picture of the one that we process with on your left. See how intricate all that is? The outer arms have patterns that are totally interwoven. There is no beginning and no end to this pattern. Why do you suppose? It's their depiction of eternity. No beginning and no end. So every inch of that cross is rich in what it's communicating to us and to the Ethiopians. And every one of them have this loop down near the uh, throat See it there? Um, let's, before we go on to the next picture, note, note the one on your right. It's here. This is a very elaborately sculptured, probably cast cross with um, Mary and the Virgin, Mary and Jesus, and the archangels on the other side, and one angel coming down from above. That's your right, but it's our left. That's correct. <laughs> You've got to know what I'm thinking, not what I'm saying. <laughs> That's what I tell Bob all the time. <laughs> so these are spectacular crosses. And the one you have is a new cross. It's not old. The one that's been here. But okay, the big question is, why those scarves? 
you would never see, those are processional crosses. You would never see processional crosses in Ethiopia without the scars. What, what is it saying? Well, the scarf hangs on large, in their services, and it's there to remind them of Jesus' body. They, he was clothed. They, you know, they stripped him. They put those cloths. This is to remind us there was a physical body on that cross. That's how they do it. Mm -hmm. And you can see they're pretty elaborate cloths that they have. Now, th this picture is all wooden um, processional cross. I have a couple small handheld wooden ones, but I don't have a big one. So, uh, But this was the most exciting picture I could find where you would see the scarves and not doubt why we had it. It was to remind us of Christ's body, but also it's victory over death. And yet, it was his body that had to be sacrificed in order for there to be victory. So it's rich. Then, um, we have three uh, handheld crosses. Now, if you were in a big procession, processions are really big in Ethiopian, uh, in Ethiopian culture, you would have had a handheld cross like this. And you might have carried it and gone down with all of the priests that carried the big processional ones. But these are also crosses of blessing. And the priest may have held it up and blessed you. And then you would have kissed the bottom of that cross. Remember the little, see there's a top and a little bottom. The way the priest held it, you can see in this picture, the girl is reaching to kiss the bottom in devotion. And then there are pectoral crosses, our crosses that are worn. And I wore some of what I had. I just wore a little array of them today. <laughs> and um, I never put this one in the, in the exhibition because I didn't want to lose it. I love this cross. It's heavy. It's rich. Um, these were made out of melted, originally out of melted down coins, nickel, maybe a little silver or whatever. But um, your left are actual crosses that are in. I've named some of them. On the right, this is from the Peabody Museum in Boston that has a big collection of <clears throat> Ethiopian crosses. Every, the crosses can be named to the towns. It's just like oriental rugs come from certain regions, certain towns. I thought that would be interesting for you to know. Um, so I'm going to conclude, but we're going to have a video. I've, I've done this in time so us to have a video. Um, yeah, these are two icons that are very unusual. It just has the text. The one on your left is, I think, a Psalms book. It's very unusual. And the one on no, the one on your right, the one on your left. I absolutely love, it's the Lamb of God. Now, my friend who was here from Kansas City last week um, run, helps run the Mercy and Truth Medical Center. Right next door is an Ethiopian church. He's going back to ask if I can get that man to do some translation for me. Now, what I'd like to do I love, would love to have inserted this earlier, but I want to take us to the Getty, and you're going to see the prayer book or the uh, gospel book. This would have been Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and there are hundreds of these inside of Orthodox churches in the northern part of Ethiopia still. But let's, let's just watch this. We're in the manuscript and drawing study room at the Getty Center. What we're looking at is an Ethiopian gospel book from the early 16th century. And a gospel book is a compilation of the four books of the gospel written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're going to start with a special page 
an image of the virgin and child enthroned. It's a full page illumination, so it has a sense of importance. It's interesting to consider this book because when we think about Christian manuscript traditions, we too often just think about Europe and not about this amazing tradition in Ethiopia. And Ethiopia has a very long tradition of Christianity. The context for this manuscript is the Solomonic dynasty. And this time we have an emperor, Tsar Yaakov, who is especially interested in the Virgin Mary, both personally, but also interested in promoting her during the liturgy. And there was a book about the miracles of the Virgin Mary that was important during this time. And that was in the mid 15th century. And this manuscript is from the very early 16th century. So it demonstrates how that tradition impacted Ethiopian manuscripts over a period of time. What's interesting about this page is that there's a fabric piece over the Virgin and child. So at first you don't see the virgin and child. We can imagine a priest perhaps during the liturgy moving through this book and then revealing the Virgin Mary. This particular manuscript we don't know exactly where it came from but there are about seven manuscripts in this style that we know are from the Gunda Gunde monastery. So what I'm noticing are very rounded forms from the Virgin Mary's face to even her forearm looks like a large oval. These elongated almond-shaped eyes, this rounded throne, and this flattening of the forms with a lot of decorative patterning. This two-dimensional effect is given by the flat application of color. So in some other manuscripts, you might see some more shading to give a sense of volume, but here the pigments applied to have a very striking design and geometric effect. And it's the textiles that lend her a sense of royalty, this image of her as the queen of heaven. And the designs on the textiles often evoke patterns that are found on textiles that were imported into Ethiopia. And the Virgin is situated within this architectural space. And then on either side, we see angels bearing swords. The two figures are the archangels, Michael and Gabriel, and they're holding swords because they're serving as protectors. Some art historians have seen these angels bearing swords as reflecting the practices in the court of the emperor himself, that there would have been armed guards on either side, and so a parallel between the earthly court of the emperor and the heavenly court of Mary and the Christ child. And this is such an interesting moment in the history of Ethiopia because the emperors of the 15th century were sending out diplomatic missions to parts of Europe, to what is today Spain, to what is today Italy, looking to visit special religious sites, but also bring back craftsmen to beautify Ethiopian churches, what makes this manuscript so unique is the presence of Mary here right at the beginning of the manuscript. And we know that's partly due to Zara Yaakov, but there's a wider context of the monastery that likely this was from, which was Stephanite, that is a reform order that criticized the extent of the emperor's veneration of the Virgin Mary. And yet here she is at the very front of this manuscript. Even though the Stephanites criticized Zara Yaakov, the tradition of of putting the Virgin Mary in the front of these still remains after his rule. So there are other marvelous things about this book. In addition to the veiled image of the Virgin and Child, we have canon tables that help the reader to follow the story of the life of Christ through the various books of the Gospels. And I'm really fascinated by the geometric patterning, but especially the interlacing at the top of the canon tables. The interlace that's used both on top of the canon table pages, also on the facing pages of the evangelist portraits, are something that is very Ethiopian, but is also used in other traditions as well. So let's look at one of the author pages. Here we're looking at John, and at the top of the page, we have an inscription written in Ge'ez, the official liturgical language of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. This portrait of John is in a long line of author portraits that appear in manuscripts across Europe and into Ethiopia and through Byzantium as well, and it features the evangelist writing their gospel. So here we have John seated. He has all of his writing implements, stylus, probably a reed pen in his hand, 
and he has his inkwell and perhaps his pigments. He has this large round golden halo that is so large it interrupts the frame above him. His body is composed of these very broad, rounded forms that almost look like his body is encased in a halo. And it also looks like he's enveloped in those luxurious textiles. Another place where these textiles show up are paste downs that are in the front and back covers of these manuscripts. And this has one of these paste downs. We're not exactly sure when this textile dates from, but it does show this tradition of using foreign imported textiles to decorate these books. Often these imported textiles were worn by the elite in Ethiopia to show their wealth. And so having a little swatch of this fabric in these gospel books endows this book with that same luxury. I want to tell you, last week I received a, a Sunday devotion that came from here in South Carolina from James Romain. Some of you may want to write this down. James Romain is an art historian and friend of mine, and he, he edited the book on my art. And um, he teaches at Landers College in upstate um, South Carolina. Every Sunday now for four Sundays, he's doing a devotion on Ethiopian art. Look up James Romain. <coughs> under YouTube Advent. R-O-M-A-I-N-E. James Romaine. But I think you'll be pleased to, uh, uh, to see that. My hope for this show, that this adds to your visual vocabulary. I hope over the four or five years that we're here, a lot of you have grown in your appreciation for the visual arts and how it can serve the Lord, how it can serve the church. And um, also how God's people have seen and shared scriptures with their own people. And um, they see it through their own cultural lenses. And my guess is that God delights in that. You know, my dad was a pretty, um, oh, he had limited views about a lot of things. And he looked out of his deathbed and he saw an um, Orthodox church. And he said, grumbled about it. And I said to my dad, I said, you know, dad, I think God might be like you. You have 10 children. Every one of them expresses their love to you slightly different. And I named some. And one of his last things he said to me, you know, Sandy, you may be right. <laughs> I think God does look alike in all of these different things that we share. And um, take time to read the labels. I know you only have a couple more weeks. Uh, look closely at the image. And my prayer is that you will see scripture as you read the Bible. When the scripture is read to me, especially during Advent, I have this movie of images that flow across my eyes that is magnifying and interpreting and illuminating the scripture. That's my prayer for God's people. Um, and I hope that this has benefited you in that way. Display of that, and then the generosity of letting us have it is just 
Well, it was just, um, just a complete joy. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Sandy. That's great. So we'll be back next week in the Strong Fellowship Hall for, um, for normal rector's form, whatever that looks like anymore. But, um, but please join us again and um, take the time to look at this amazing artwork. And um, say, uh, if you see Sandra Bob, just thank them directly. We will stay after the main worship service if anyone would like me to take them around. Awesome. All right. See you all in 15 minutes.